Thanks for watching the video today. I'm your host, Diego, D-I-E-G-O, and today we're building a Johnson Sioux bioreactor. A Johnson Sioux bioreactor is a great tool to do your composting because it doesn't require turning, it doesn't require you to mix greens and browns, it uses a low amount of water, and you won't generate smells and flies. It's a very passive way to get really high quality, fungally dominated compost on your property. Today, this is a build video. I'm gonna take you through the whole process of how to make one of these step by step. If you wanna hear more of the theory about the Johnson Sioux Bioreactor, check out the link right here and also below where I go into more detailed thoughts on this build process. But a lot of people just wanted a quick how-to video that showed all the steps involved. Well, that's what this video is. Also, I'll have an interview with Dr. David Johnson, the creator of this bioreactor, coming up on this channel. When that's posted, I'll link to that below. So be sure to check that out so you can hear more about why you're actually using this tool and what this tool can do for your garden soil. So with no further ado, let's jump right into it and get building a Johnson Sioux bioreactor. The very first thing you're going to need is a pallet. David recommends a standard size pallet, which is 40 by 48 inches. Once you've laid your pallet, then you want to identify the center of the pallet. Using that center point, you're going to draw a circle on the pallet that has a diameter, that's the total distance across, of 28 and 3 8 inches. Then around that circle, you're going to place five four and three eighths inch diameter circles 72 degrees apart. You can see all those specs on the diagram that I'm showing here. Why these holes are important is because eventually we're going to put the pipes into these holes. Placement on the pallet can be a little bit tough. You wanna try and leave as much structure in the pallet as possible. The next step will be to cut out the holes. Now the holes are cut, I now want to check structure in the pallet itself. We've removed a lot of material, what's weak, what's not. These two boards are the weakest, they're not supported in the center. These boards here are still pretty strong, so I'm just going to use a small piece of decking to put underneath here, like this, just to hold that up so it doesn't totally collapse. All the holes, they're not perfect circles, that's okay, the pipes fit in all of them. We'll get this done and move on to the next step. The next material you're gonna need for the build is landscape fabric. For the next step, we need to take one of our six foot by six foot pieces of landscape fabric, lay it over the pallet, and then we're gonna cut holes in the fabric where we have holes in the pallet. If it's windy or you need to walk away, one thing I've found useful is just to use a staple gun to tack down the landscape fabric so it doesn't move once you get the holes lined up. Once you have your landscape fabric, you need to cut a piece that is 13 feet, six inches long, and we'll use that in the next step. The next step in the build is getting your cage cut. This is concrete reinforcing mesh. It's five feet tall. You wanna cut 12 feet, six inches worth of it off of the roll. Go as close as you can to 12 feet six. When I lined it up against this vertical, wire, it came to like 12 feet four, that's perfectly fine. When you cut the reinforcing mesh, one thing you wanna be sure to do is cut it flush along one side. The other side, you can leave long. Those little wires sticking out is what you're going to use to hold the cage shut. So leave one side long. You also wanna be sure to cut all the little pieces sticking off the top and the bottom off. You want a smooth surface across the top. Once you have your mesh cut, the next thing to do is lay it out flat. So find an area that you can lay this out nice and flat. To sew this on, I'm not using anything special. I think this is electric fence wire that I'm using and I've cut one end of it to a point to allow it just to puncture the fabric easier. And I'm just gonna do a in-out looping pattern. The whole length of the cage in the landscape fabric and then I'm gonna repeat it on the bottom. I'm not gonna do the ends. For the sewing, we're gonna wanna make sure that we fold over the end 
to the underside of the cage, and we want to make sure we fold over the bottoms to the underside. So all of our fold over is down here, leaving us a nice clean surface on this side. Push through all the layers. We're around the wire. We're just going to anchor this end. And then we're going to go and feel for the wires that are running upward. And we're going to go inside each one, making sure to puncture through all the layers. Pulling the wire nice and tight, continually tucking underneath like this. And then we go up to our next wire through and through. And we're just going to repeat that process the whole way down the length. Sewn up, it's going to look like this, just the wire holding the landscape fabric to the inside of the cage. Now we're going to need to start cutting down our drain pipe. You're going to want to measure off six foot lengths of each section of pipe and then cut it down. One thing I did to all of my drain pipes after cutting it was I added this rope handle. I simply drilled two holes in either side and I put a rope handle in there just to give you some extra grip if you needed it to pull the pipes out. When assembling the cage to the bioreactor, you're going to want to keep the felt on the inside, the cage is on the outside. You're going to take your smooth end of the cage and you're going to tuck that underneath the end that left the pointy wires. The cage is going to have some curvature to it, so work with that. And then you're simply going to make the cage as big as you can so the whole thing fits on the pallet. So as it sits right here, I need to go around and check the bottom of the pallet and make sure none of this cage is overhanging. To enclose this, I'm going to take these wires and I'm going to go behind the existing wires in the cage like this. I'll pull it back together and then I will just bend these wires back like this. And this is what will keep the cage from unwinding. Now that our cage is together, I've rechecked to make sure it's all on the pallet. It is. I'm just going to use some screws and screw the cage to the pallet just so it doesn't move when we're installing the pipes and filling it. Obviously the screws aren't going to hold this thing up long term. What's going to hold it up is its shape being a cylinder and the fact that it's going to be full of a lot of weight. The screws just keep the cage in place while we fill it. Next step, we're going to install the pipes into the bioreactor. Pretty simple, we're just gonna drop them in from the top into the holes in the pallet. And then we're gonna need to secure them up top to make sure they stay vertical. I'm gonna put the pipes in and then show you how I secure them right now. The pipes are now installed in the bioreactor. The next step is to secure them at the top to keep them as vertical as possible. That's important because those pipes aren't going to permanently live in the bioreactor. We're gonna pull those out after a few days. So the straighter they are, the easier they are to pull out cleanly. We want to be able to eventually remove them and leave a nice hole all throughout the pile where the pipe was. The pipe is just a placeholder temporarily. So keeping the pipe as vertical as possible enables us to smoothly remove it and leave a nice air hole when the pipe comes out. To do that, there's a few ways we can do that. David Johnson shows a nice little jig that he welded up that sits right on top of here that you can easily just wire the pipes to that metal jig. I didn't want to make one of those, so I'm just going to use PVC. I'm just going to lay the PVC across the top of the reactor like this. I'm going to secure it on both ends, and then I'm going to use a level to attach two pipes to this pipe, keeping them as vertical as possible. And then I'll repeat the process, adding two other pipes to attach the remaining four air pipes in the reactor the idea is just to give them a temporary hold while the material gets put in because once the material's in here, the material will hold the pipes vertical and this can come off. Next step is to fill it. To fill it, I use these totes. It takes about 30 of these to fill this bioreactor. The material that I'm working with is pretty fresh. It's already pretty moist from some rain, so I'm not going to be wetting it a ton as it goes in. You want to try and pour it in, spread it around the reactor evenly, and work your way up 
so the pipes stay nice and straight. Once it's in there, we're done. We'll let it sit for a few days and then pull out the air pipes. The bioreactor has been sitting for five days. It's now time to remove the air pipes from the top. For my irrigation timer, this is what I'm using. This is the Orbit 62061N timer. If you are gonna get a timer for your reactor, make sure that you get one that allows you to change the frequency, how often, and make sure you can do it for, you know, some amount less than 15 minutes at a time because these reactors don't require a lot of water. For the drip line, this is what I'm using. 12 inch spacing, 100 gallon per hour drip line. There's nothing special about this. Use whatever you had. This is what I had around, so that's why I used it. There isn't a right answer here. You just need drip line inside of the reactors. Don't get caught up on the brand or the spacing or anything like that. Just get drip line. When laying out the drip line, I really tried to keep it simple. I just ran a line around the inside perimeter of the reactor, and I also crossed it twice against the center. The whole goal was just trying to get, you know, representative coverage to try and keep most of the area wet. And this was the simplest way to do it using the least amount of fittings and the fittings that I actually had on hand. Again, there's no right way to do this. So don't overcomplicate it. The whole key here is you don't want to see water draining out the bottom of the composter. If you see that, then you're adding too much water. One other important step in building a Johnson 2 bioreactor is adding worms to the system. When adding the worms to your reactor, there's no right way. There's no wrong way. Pretty simple. Dig a hole, pour the worms in, cover the worms up, and we're good to go. Let the worms go wherever they want within the pile. I don't think it's important to add these to several spots. My thought is add them all to one spot in a hyper concentration so they have a better chance of surviving in the pile versus putting a few worms in a few spots around the pot. The last and final step in completing the reactor is I'm going to be adding landscape fabric to the top of the reactor. This should just keep some sunlight off the soil surface, which should help the worms establish themselves. It should also slow down evaporation a little bit from the top for all the water that we're now adding to the system. And this is the same exact landscape fabric that we used around the sides and on the bottom of the reactor. To keep the landscape fabric from blowing away, you can simply just tuck it into the wire mesh of the structure itself. There you have it, the Johnson Sioux bioreactor. Pretty cheap to build, fairly quick to build, very, very easy to manage. With the end of the gardening season coming up, what are you going to do with all your garden waste? Think about putting it in a Johnson Sioux bioreactor. If you want to learn more about the reactor, check out some of the other videos that I have detailing my experiences with the bioreactor. I've linked to those below and join me next time for more videos on improving soil composting and biointensive gardening. Thanks for watching. Until next time, be nice, be thankful, and do the work.